Okay, I think we're ready to begin. So we can start right on time there. Once again, I want to thank you for coming. Uh, this is ser number seven, as I put on the thing here. And uh, I've always said that you don't have to have come to the other ones in order to come to this one. Because uh, I always do a little bit of review, but for the most part, it's always uh, some, some other book of the Bible or some other aspect of the gospel that we haven't dealt with before. And so even though in this particular one, I am going to give us a little uh, two reminders of our very first Bible course, uh, Bible 101, <laughs> as I call it, <clears throat> just so we remember, because the book of Jonah has a lot to do with those two points that we brought up back then. It always, uh, this stuff is always connected, you know. All right, so let's move on with our prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. As we gather together in this course, dispel in us the distractions and concerns of the day, and open our hearts and minds to understand the truth of your word. Send us your Holy Spirit to assist and guide us in our longing to become more like Christ, your Son. We ask this in his name. Amen. Mary, seat of wisdom, mother of good counsel, and cause of our joy, grant us wisdom to live by God's word, counsel, and strengthen us in our faith, and pray for us that we may live in joy one day with your Son, and with all the saints in glory. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady of Charity, pray for us. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. All right. A big thank you to Susan and Hannah who are here. Uh, I think Susan set all that up. Did you help too, Hannah? <laughs> Let's give a big round of applause. And to Stuart for getting all the equipment set up so that this can be... So that this is available, by the way, on the diocesan website as well. For those who can't come to these, they can check it out on the website. I think it's under Adult Faith, isn't it? Or it's under that. And there are also discs, I think, that they've made here of previous uh, talks. Eh? <clears throat> all right. Here's what we're going to talk about today. The book of Jonah... God's revelation in story-cartoon form. Now, I often say, whenever we have this book, this first reading, usually during the year, oftentimes this will come up from the book of Jonah. I think I upset some of the people at the cathedral uh, at the 12.10, at the 9 o'clock mass, because I could see them kind of fidgeting a bit when I say the, the book of Jonah is actually a cartoon. Hmm. Does that mean the whole Bible's a cartoon? No, it's not. And of course, maybe I shouldn't say that because you have to have background in the Bible to understand exactly what that means. <laughs> Otherwise, to call it a cartoon sounds like everything's a fable or a legend, but it's not that. But the book itself is a cartoon, but not the whole Bible. And so we're going to look at that, and it's not just a cartoon to make us laugh. It does make us laugh. But cartoons that make us laugh can also teach us many things, and we're going to see that. Many people read the cartoon page all the time in the paper, and they don't even read the front page story. <laughs> you know? They say they get more out of the cartoons, out of, or sometimes the editorial cartoon. That's usually pretty loaded stuff, eh? And so it depends on your political stripes. Oftentimes, this can be pretty offensive to certain parties or whatever, wherever the guy's coming from, eh? So that's what we're talking about. It is God's revelation. That's why it belongs in the Bible. It is part of the Bible. And it's God telling us something about himself. But it's in cartoon form. So people will understand it in a nicer way kind of thing. You know, it's not all that, you know, long, drawn out kind of thing. Eh? It's more bubbly. It's the Father Luigi of the Bible kind of thing. <laughs> I, I had to say that. I had to say that. <clears throat> Sorry, Father Luigi. <laughs> no, that's a good thing. He's very bubbly, eh? I've got to say, I'm exhausted usually just talking to him. You know? And I'm usually fairly bubbly. Okay, 
Recalling principles. Now, here's Bible 101, like I said we would have to uh, talk about again. Recalling, I better go over here so I can see what I'm saying. Recalling principles number three and number four from, for interpreting the Bible from our very first Bible course. And those of you who are here will remember. And those of you who weren't, I usually repeat it every once in a while. So it'll, it won't be, uh, it'll be familiar to you. Number three of the interpretation of the Bible that we took in Bible 101 was that whenever we read the Bible, we have to distinguish what the story is and what the message is. I call the story the frame, but the message is the portrait, or the Mona Lisa in this case. The portrait is much more important than the frame. The story is not important. The, it's the frame, that's, it's the portrait that's important. The frame is just the story. But it gets a message across to us. So we have to look for the message. And you'll also recall that in uh, Bible 101, I spoke about the Word of God is the golden strand which runs through the entire sweater of the Bible. And if you remember, I gave you this little chart. The yellow sweater, here's the golden thread that runs through it, but it's hard to see because it's the same color. But if you magnify it, it's pretty clear to see. There's the thread, there's the rest of the sweater. It's not the sweater we're interested in in the Bible, it's the thread. Because the thread is God's word, the sweater oftentimes is made up of words of all kinds of different people, especially the author. And what's mixed up in that is his culture and background and all the rest of it that we talked about before. So tonight we're going to look at the message of the book of Jonah. We're looking at the story too, but the message is much more important. So that's the first thing to remember. Number four of Bible 101 was this. Remember that the Bible is like a newspaper and not a book. Even though it looks like a book. It's like a newspaper in the sense that it has different genres of writing in the Bible. All kinds of genres. And uh, you may recall this, I put this same slide. <laughs> I'm not pushing, I hope that's not somebody's relative that passed away. Anyway, <laughs> this goes back quite a few years. Uh, and uh, there's, you know, the G Harper's getting rid of the GST, so you can imagine how long ago this was. <laughs> He's cutting the GST. And uh, some genres communicate uh, in figurative ways. And that's what the book of Jonah does. It communicates God's message to us, but in figurative ways. Not literally, but figuratively. Okay? And that's an important thing to keep in mind. We do it all the time in the newspaper. No one's going to read the comic the way he reads the front page story, or the obituary is not like the front page story in the comic. We, we kind of do a... a a mental exercise when we read the paper. <clears throat> we don't have to say, oh, front page story now. I better click into that one now. No, we just do it automatically. Front page story, we have a different attitude. Editorial page, different attitude. It's somebody's opinion, but it might be my opinion too, but it doesn't have to be. Whereas the front page story hopefully is more facts. You hope, although you wonder. <laughs> you know, sometimes you wonder how much fact is there. All right. How do, we how do we communicate? We do it all the time, by the way. We just don't think about it. We do it all the time. We communicate messages to other people in figurative ways. And these are the things that I can think of. I'm sure there's many more. But these are the ones I wanted to talk about today. One of them is idiomatic expressions. And we're going to look at those in a minute. Paintings and art. I'm not an artist, but I love, I love watching videos on paintings, explaining what the artist is trying to teach us, you know? I just love watching those. I spend most evenings watching these DVDs of paintings uh, and, and what they mean. Um, stories and cartoons, they always give us a message, but they're not literally true. They're figuratively true. And then biblical stories, and that's where it takes us to the book of Jonah. Okay? But we're going to talk about the other things first. You're going to be able to relate with the next slide, I'm sure. Idiomatic expressions. You've probably said some of these things yourself. It's raining cats and dogs. I don't think they say that anymore. 
Pitchforks and something else used to be another one. Remember? It's raining pitchforks and buckets and I don't know. Anyway, you get the idea. Take it with a grain of salt. Um, hold your tongue. Hold your horses. We're all in the same boat. That drives me up the wall. Everyone thinks you're wrong. I love that one. A lot of people use that one when they don't agree with you. Everybody thinks you're wrong. Or everybody thinks you're crazy, you know. Uh, name three people. <laughs> Usually they can't get by two people. <laughs> but everybody thinks you're wrong. <laughs> no. That's just to make it more powerful, you see. And that's Greek to me or it's Greek to me. It just, it, obviously these are all figurative speech. They're not literal. It's not raining cats and dogs. It never does. <laughs> we know that. We don't need anybody to tell us that. We just know it. <laughs> Because that's the way we talk. And so to a Jewish person who would have read the book of Jonah, he did not have to be told that this was a cartoon. He would have known that. But to people living in the 21st century, because we don't have that Jewish mentality, that Jewish mindset for the Old Testament, we might not get the same message. We think it's literal. Just like maybe 2,000 years from now, if they dig up these sayings, they might think, my gosh, it must have rained cats and dogs in the year 20, 2018. You know, obviously it didn't. Okay? So that's how the book of Jonah works. Okay, so these are the idiomatic expressions. Paintings and art. Now, nowadays, you're always told about the Da Vinci Last Supper and how Da Vinci put all these different messages in there and how the church has been trying to hide this and... That's baloney. The church has not been trying to hide it. The church has known about it all the time. And it's nothing to hide. Why hide it? If that's what he wanted to say. He was the artist. He said it. We're not trying to hide it. This is not a big plot against people. Even though if you watch YouTube sometimes, they, they all look like these big plots that the church has developed to hide reality from their people or something. Very anti-Catholic, some of those... Um, some of those posts, eh? So let's look at two paintings, it's two of my favorite paintings. Um, they're probably fairly familiar to you, especially the top one, Hunters in the Snow by Bruegel, or Bruegel as they say. Hunters in the Snow, and the bottom one is The Fall of Icarus by Bruegel as well. You may have seen the top one, the bottom one is not as uh, famous a painting. Uh, Let's look at the top one first, Bruegel's Hunters in the Snow. It looks like a nice scene, a nice winter scene. But that's not why Bruegel painted this pa painting. It's not to show us a nice scene. It's to show us, number one, that winter can be very hard on people. That would be my side of the story. <laughs> I hate winter. I hate winter. I always concentrate on the left side of the painting. And I see these bedraggled hunters coming back in the snow, trudging along with these mangy looking, or whatever you, mangy, mangy looking dogs. Look at these guys. They're, they're worse off than the hunters. And they're supposed to be with it, you know. The hunters, all they've caught is a little rabbit or something that's hanging on the back. You can't see it very well because it's such a small shot of it. But that's what it is. However, the famous thing about this painting is that there's a bird there. See the bird in the, that's flying over? Apparently, at least that's what artists say when you watch the commentaries on this, is that the bird connects the two sides of the story. If that bird wasn't there, the picture would be very different. That bird connects us between the terrible part of winter, which is this, and the fun part of winter. Notice in the fun part, there are people skating, they're curling, they're fishing in the, on the ice. Things that I never do, but a lot of people do. People who like winter can't wait for it to snow, can't wait for it to get cold. Well, that's the other side of winter. So Bruhal is saying, don't condemn winter. It might be bad for you, but it might be wonderful for other people. So he's trying to teach us how to be tolerant of every understanding within, uh, I guess it was in, I think it was in Belgium. I think it was Belgium, uh, Bruegel. 
And he was the northern renaissance anyway. And so that's what he, it's not a nice scene. I say, isn't that nice? I want that for over my fireplace. No, it has a meaning to it. But the literal thing is a nice scene of winter. Okay? Another painting, the one at the bottom there, it's called The Fall of Icarus. Now, this is a completely different message, but it's done by the same artist. I love this one. I have this in my house, and I have it in my kitchen. When I'm having breakfast, I always look at this painting before I go, I go to church eh? in the morning. Because this teaches something about being realistic. Okay? Now, we, I think we, most of us know that old Greek folk story about Daedalus and Icarus. Daedalus was the father of Icarus. And Daedalus made these big wings for themselves so that they could escape from the Isle of Crete. This is a legend, obviously, the Greek legend. Eh? And so he made these huge wings out of feather and tied together with wax, you see or tar, whatever they used. And he said to his son Icarus, now don't fly too close to the sun because you'll melt the wax and you'll fall. But Icarus, being a young man, thinking he could conquer the world like most young men can, or think they can, he, flew, he didn't care about his father. His father flew low, but he flew high. And guess what happened? The, the wings melted and he fell. And here he is in the water, you just see his legs. <laughs> there, there he is over there. Now, that's a big tragedy that has just happened. I, I mean, it's the center of Daedalus' life as his son has just fallen into the water. This is quite an event. But a lot of people aren't even aware, number one. And number two, don't seem to care. Like, this guy's still plowing his field. That guy is, you know, he uh, has a flock of sheep and he's taking care of the sheep. He's looking up in the air. He thinks he heard something up there, but he doesn't know what's going on. He never thought of looking in the water where the two legs are going crazy. <laughs> the ship, the ship doesn't even, the ship seems to be going its own way. It's like we might think that we're the center of attention, but we're not. We're not. We never are. We might be to some people. But we're not to most people. And what Bruhel is trying to teach us that, that do things not to be famous. Do things because they're the right things to do. Don't worry about being famous. If you're famous, people will recognize it. If you're not, who cares? That's really what he's saying. Even somebody like Icarus who fell in the water, you'd think everybody would be flying down there to catch him. No. They're just leaving him. Now, it's tragic that they're not helping him. They should be helping them. But that's not the point of the story. The point of the story is something that may be extremely important to one person is not that important to somebody else. In a way, it's a little bit like that winter scene. Something that's good for somebody is not all that good for everybody else. And so the painting is nice, but that's not why I have it in my kitchen. <laughs> it's to remind myself that whatever I do today, I should be doing for the right reason. Not so people say, wow, it's great you're doing that. All that stuff, you know? Even though that may sound good, it never lasts. Eh? <laughs> never lasts. All right. Everybody knows this one. The Last Judgment in the Sistine Chapel. Michelangelo. Now there, yeah, but of course it's about the Last Judgment. But Michelangelo has put many, many messages in this painting. I'm just going to show you two. I put little stars in front. See this one here? These two men being pulled up by this one man, pulling them up, right here. Now, you're going to see it in bigger in a minute. But this is, to locate it on the painting, it looks pretty innocuous here, because everybody looks at Jesus, and they don't look down here. This is one, and this is another, this man down there in the corner. Now, here's what they are, a little bigger. Here's the guy pulling up. The two men, he's using a rosary. He's not using a rope. He's using a rosary. Michelangelo is teaching people that you can pray for people to get to heaven. You can help them by reciting the rosary. Everybody thinks Michelangelo was a bad guy. <clears throat> he wasn't all that bad. He was better than most people think. <clears throat> I think I'm going to take this off because I think this is pressing on my neck. Whoa. 
Now I know how horses feel when they have this big... Okay. Oh, dear. Oh, anyway, all right. So, so you see how significant this is. What Michelangelo is saying is we should pray for those who have died because we can, we can bring them into heaven. They're not damned. Many of them are in purgatory as far as he's concerned. That's what he's trying to teach. So when you say the rosary, it's an effective prayer for those who have died. That's what he's saying. Now, what about that guy? <laughs> now, let's go back. I want you to see where he placed them. Right in that corner, way down in the right corner. He's right in the pit of hell, the furthest down you could go in hell with all, the, all these, uh, here's, uh, you know, Satan and all the rest of them, all right? Now, let's look at the big one. Look how scary those guys look beside him with the big eyes, eh? <laughs> And there's a snake around him. And notice his ears. What do they look like? Now, those are supposed to be donkey ears. Donkey. Big donkey. Or jackass, basically. That's what he... The artist is doing that on purpose. This is supposed to represent the man who at the time was the master of ceremonies of the Pope, Julius II. Julius II was the Pope. This guy was his master of of uh, liturgy or master of ceremonies. So he was a big shot in the Vatican, you know, in those days. So whatever he said, usually the cardinals and the pope would listen to him because he was in charge of all the liturgical functions, masters of ceremony. If you were at the uh, Chrism Mass, as many of you were, you'll notice Father Victor, he did all that. That's what a master of ceremonies does. He directs the whole ceremony. A very important person in the ceremony. What did this, I can't even remember his name, this guy, what did he do? Well, when Michelangelo painted the Sistine Chapel, the uh, figures did not have any loincloths or anything. They were completely naked. This man complained to the Pope that it was a scandal that this artwork would be put into a chapel with these naked people in there. <laughs> now, Michelangelo said, yeah, but that's art. That's, this is art. You don't understand. Stick to your liturgy. I'll stick to my art. I don't tell you how to do your work. But the Pope listened to him. And Michelangelo had to put all those little loincloths, those little things. They were all added later, not only by Michelangelo, but by many other artists too. They added all these little things so you wouldn't see genitals, basically. Okay? Now, maybe you think that's a good idea, and maybe it is. But when Michelangelo was a little offended that he, a person who had no idea of what art was was telling the artist how to do art. And so he said, I'll fix him. I'll put him in hell. That's what I'll do. <laughs> and he's a jackass. He doesn't know what he's talking about. So I'll give him those ears. See those ears? <clears throat> and it's so scary with this big snake wrapped around him. He, had to, he hasn't got a chance. Even if you pray the rosary for him, it won't work. <laughs> So you see how artists, they put little messages in their artwork. And you know that from the Last Supper, but it's not just the Last Supper. Here's another piece of art. This is a sculpture in Rome. If you ever go to Rome, go to this piazza. It's called the Piazza of uh, Santa Maria in Minerva, Sopra Minerva. And it's near the Pantheon. There's a big elephant. And behind the elephant is the Church of Santa Maria, Sopra Minerva, it's called. So the elephant has its side facing the church. Now this is significant because the artist put the elephant in this position for a reason. <laughs> the elephant has his backside to this building in the square. Now that building was the office of the Inquisition when this guy made the, you know, this was Bernini. So this is the 1500s. The Inquisition tortured people. That, you, know, you know about the Inquisition. He didn't like the Inquisition, but he couldn't say anything against the Inquisition, or he would be inquisited if there's such a thing, <laughs> okay? Because the Inquisition was very powerful, and no one asked questions. You were stuck. You were gone, basically. No rights, no. And so I'll show them, he said. I'll make the elephant so that his backside is facing the Inquisition. That's what I think of you guys over there. And... He's got his trunk. The trunk is not up this way. It's up here, but over that way. You notice it's facing the other side. 
This building is the Vatican Diplomatic School. It's still there today. Now, the Inquisition is gone. The building's there, but it's something else. But the Vatican uh, Diplomatic School is still there. What does that do? Well, it trains people to be diplomats, you know, to say things that are nice. And, you know, these cardinals that are nuncios all over the world, you know, they're part of the diplomacy of the church. So they never call a spade a spade. They just kind of make it sound diplomatic. You know, <laughs> you're very diplomatic. He didn't care too much about them either. So you guys are a bunch of phonies. You know what I think of you guys? Now, that's true. This is true. <laughs> I'm not making this up. Bernini, well, they couldn't do anything to him because every time someone says, well, you did that. No, I didn't. I just put the elephant there. <laughs> that's your interpretation. But I'm the artist. I'm the only one who can tell you, right? The reason I put this is many times we think that art is just there to be nice. No, usually it's there for a message. Even the artists tried to give us messages in their own time. Nowadays, of course, it doesn't mean a whole lot to people. Tourists come, they take a million pictures of this elephant. They don't know many of them. But if you read the tourist books, you'll probably get the real story. You know? Now, let's look at stories and cartoons. <laughs> I'm laughing because I... There's one, <laughs> there is one cartoon here I could not stop laughing. And the secretary came into the office. She thought I was sick. I was going, I was laughing. I said, Father, are you okay? I said, yeah, I'm okay. I said, you won't believe this cartoon. I just found it by chance, eh? Now, not this one. <laughs> this isn't a funny one. Well, this is, you know, the three, the three little pigs. Yeah, it's a cartoon. Everybody knows the cartoon. But what does it tell us? Who cares about the cartoon? Obviously, there isn't going to be a wolf saying, I'm going to blow your house down, and a pig saying, I built... No, it's saying, if you build a brick house, you're safer than building a straw house, right? Now, I don't know who developed this cartoon. Maybe it was a builder or a bricklayer or somebody. I don't know. But that's, it's not the story. It's the message that's more important. <laughs> these aren't the funny ones either. <laughs> but these aren't bad. Now, <laughs> this is politically incorrect. I'm sorry. But I found it on there. They, these are the four politics. Obviously, you, you know who they are. You know, there's Harper, and I guess it's Trudeau before he was elected, and uh, what's, what was his name? Mulcair. Mul Mul <laughs> and Elizabeth May. All right. If I only had a heart, if I only had a brain, if I only had a smile, if I only had a prayer. <laughs> now, obviously, uh, the cartoonist. You know, obviously he's using the Wizard of Oz, but he thought this would be a neat way of getting across. They know what the Wizard of Oz is all about. If I can transfer it to today, they'll get the message, but not the story. Who cares about the story? Over there, the guy who did that doesn't like Trudeau, probably, because he's taking a selfie of himself with the Queen, thinking, look at me. <laughs> I'm with the Queen. Here, Harper, it's got Harper's name here, the reset button on Parliament. I guess that's when he... He said, that's it, we're, uh, whatever they called it, pro or pro -rogue. So the reset button. And over there, you know, the four symbols of Canada now, one is cannabis in the bottom, as you can see. Everybody knows maple syrup and the moose and the Mountie, but what about the, the marijuana plant? So you see, every one of these has, has a message. <laughs> we're getting close. These are hilarious. No, if you're an, I'm sorry if you're an optometrist. But <laughs> Oh my god. He obviously couldn't even read the first. <laughs> How about this? <laughs> and that one talk about subliminal message. You need to purchase some new spectacles. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> now, the next one is hilarious. Oh. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> oh, 
my God. This poor little guy with these. <laughs> the reason these are funny is because often this happens. The doctor will say, ah, you know, you'll grow into it. <laughs> and the mother's saying, oh my God, that's my son. You know, I mean, <laughs> I don't know who makes these things up, but they are hilarious. But obviously, they're not taking it literally. <laughs> now you know why I kept laughing in my office. And uh, All right. <laughs> Now we got to get serious again. All right. Now let's look at the actual book of Jonah. So I've broken it down. Like otherwise, it's not a very long book. But if you typed every single word from the book, you know, it would be oh, you know, page after page after page. So I've basically gotten some brief highlights of the book of Jonah. But the major highlights. So you'll know what was happening in the book. Okay. Of course, I, I don't know, I just got this off the internet. This is a, a, supposed to be the whale eating up Jonah, you know? So, the hidden message now, just like we had hidden messages in all the others, we have a hidden message in the book of Jonah. Let's begin. Chapter 1, here's how it begins. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Go at once to Nineveh, that great city. And cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. So he wants Jonah to do a job for him. The God, God does, Yahweh. You go to Nineveh. Nineveh was a city though, in those days of about 100,000 people. In those days it was huge. And it took, I don't know how many days to cross back and forth, to walk across it. It tells us that in the book. Okay? So there he is. He's being called by God to do a job for him. To take on a ministry or a mission. Okay? But Jonah set out to flee to Tarshish. Tarshish was in the opposite direction of Nineveh. So he did this on purpose. He didn't just kind of miss, miss the, the road. He purposely went in the opposite direction to where God wanted him to go. Because he thought, if I go far away, God will forget about his call. You see? So he went, he went to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid his fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. You see how it mentions the presence of the Lord twice? Away from the presence. Like, this is trouble. This is going to be trouble. You just know it. It's coming. And the listeners to this story would have gone, mm, oh boy, no, not good, not good. Something's going to happen. Okay. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and such a mighty storm came upon the sea that the ship threatened to break up. Okay, So the big storm at sea. Okay. Whenever there's a storm at sea in the Bible, oftentimes it's figurative message about a real problem here. Either God is upset or the devil is upset. You should remember that. Either the power of evil, foaming things up, or God, you're not doing his will, so he's going to straighten things out a little bit. Okay? Figuratively speaking, that's usually the message of a storm at sea, no matter where it happens. Okay? Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried to his God, because they were all pagans, eh? except for Jonah. Uh, they threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea, to lighten it for them. Jonah, meanwhile, had gone down into the hold of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. Now, he didn't even know what was going on. He was down. The captain came and said to him, What are you doing sound asleep? <laughs> Get up. Call on your God. Perhaps the God will spare us so that we do not perish. The sailors said to one another, Come, let us cast lots so that we may know on whose account this calamity has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell to Jonah. There he is. Not a very good way of figuring out whose fault it is. <laughs> Just throwing dice. <laughs> they did a lot of that throwing dice in those days. In fact, what, it, what I find very fascinating is that for the apostles to choose another apostle to replace Judas Iscariot, it says they cast lots, and the lot went to uh, Matthias. Matthias replaced Judas. How did they pick him? With dice. <laughs> Even the apostles. And they thought if the dice went to him, maybe God wants him. That's how they reasoned, eh? Okay. 
Yeah, it sounds like a witch. <laughs> then they said to him, tell us why this calamity has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? Of what people are you? They don't know who he is. They just, he's just the guy on the boat. He paid his fare and they let him. I am a Hebrew. I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. So Jonah is not afraid. He claims to be a believer in Yahweh. And he's not afraid of these other people. Then the men were even more afraid. It was the men who were afraid, the mariners. And what the story is trying to, what the, uh, story is trying to get across to us is, is most of the world knew that Yahweh was the real God, but they would never worship him. They worshiped all these pagan gods, but in their heart of hearts, they really knew. Well, that's debatable. I don't know if that's true. But the, art, the uh, author of the story is trying to get that across to us, that the God of the Jews was the real God, and everybody knew it, if they really were honest about it, okay? The, then the men were even more afraid and said to him, what is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them so. Then they said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? He said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea. <laughs> How brave can you get, eh? Then the sea will quiet down for you, for I know it is because of me that this great storm has come upon you. He's starting to realize now that he made a big mistake running away from God. He should have paid more attention, that he could never run from God. Okay? Nevertheless, these men were pretty nice men. They weren't bad people. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring the ship back to land, but they could not. Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, O Lord, we pray, do not let us perish on account of this man's life. Do not make us guilty of innocent blood. This is as they're throwing him over. <laughs> Don't punish us for this. <laughs> so they picked Jonah up and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. <laughs> Flat sea again. Now, you know, this is why it's a cartoon. It's a cartoon. <laughs> okay. But the Lord provided a large fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. Three is always a big number, eh? Three days and three nights. Remember that Jesus was in the grave for three days and three nights. You know, that's, Jesus makes references to Jonah once in a while. It doesn't mean that he believed exactly how, the way Jonah was written. He understood that it was a cartoon, but there was a message there that he was trying to get across to the Jews. Just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days, so the Son of Man will be in the belly of the earth for three days. You know, he's trying to make a comparison here. Okay. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. Here he is. In the whale. The whale's happy, but he's not. <laughs> From the belly of the fish, saying, I called to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. See? And the message is, if you're in distress, and you call upon the Lord, he will answer you. That's the message, another part of the message of the story of Jonah. Okay? All these little messages are intertwined in the story. Okay? Eh? As my life was ebbing away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you. Okay? So there he is praying. Then the Lord spoke to the fish, and it spewed Jonah out upon the dry land. The good news is he's still alive. The bad news is he's in Nineveh. <laughs> <laughs> the last part he wants to be in. You know, the last place he wants to be in. And he realizes that once the fish swims away and he looks around and says, oh no, what am I doing here? I don't want to be here. Now I've got to start talking and everything else and I don't know how to talk. And I, I wish the Lord would pick somebody else, you know? You see how all these messages are coming across the call of God? We're going to see them more clearly later on. But you can start seeing them already. All these different messages that are intertwined into the story, which is true. The messages are true. The story might be, a, might be a cartoon, but that doesn't mean that there's no veracity to the message, the, the story. 
The message is true. Okay? Chapter 3. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. <laughs> now, in most of the times when we read the book of Jonah, we start here. We forget about the first time where he tried to run away from the Lord. So everybody thinks, what a nice guy Jonah was. He always listened to the Lord. No, he didn't. He never listened to the Lord. He only listened to the Lord when bad things started happening to him. And then he listened to the Lord. There's another message. Sometimes we don't care about the Lord until things happen in our life that aren't too exciting. And then all of a sudden, Lord, do something. We're in trouble. Do something for us. And you'd almost think the Lord would say, well, where were you 20 years ago? <laughs> or whatever. But the Lord will never say that. And that's the other part of the message, that it doesn't matter how many times you run away from the Lord. If you come back to the Lord, he'll take you back. <clears throat> So he came the second time saying, get up. The same message. Get up. Go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So now Jonah thinks twice about it. Number one, the fish is gone. He can't swim. He's on the shores of Nineveh. Where's he going to go? There's no place to go. It's almost like, I might as well try it. Maybe it'll work. <laughs> what are the odds? And what, are my, what have I got to lose, basically? You know. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh. He did, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days journey. Jonah began to go into the city going a day's walk, and he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Forty days, always the number for uh, testing, the testing time. 40 days of Lent, excuse me, 40 days of Jesus in the desert, 40 days it rained, 40 days and 40 nights for Noah. 40 is a big number, and it means a testing time, a time of testing, a time of seeing whether you fit the bill or not. You know? So he said, 40 days, if you don't give up in 40 days, big bad things are going to happen to you. Now, this is a very much an Old Testament attitude of God. Very Old Testament view. Because notice what the book says. Who knows? God may relent and change his mind. Like he was ready to destroy them. You know, the Old Testament version of God. Eh? Which Jesus told us is not true. That's what people thought. But Jesus said, God's not like that. He's our Father. He wants you to come back to him. He's not going to punish you. He wants to save you. But in the Old Testament, they didn't seem to know that. He may turn from his fierce anger. God's angry with everybody. He is angry like a human being would be angry with someone. But Jesus says, God is not like that. So that we do not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. So now, Jonah is successful in the call. He's successful. You'd think he'd be excited. No. He's a bit of a wreck, you know. He really is. He wouldn't be my best friend, I'll tell you that. Because he has all this success, and he's upset that the people actually ask for forgiveness. <laughs> he wanted them to be punished. What a terrible thing. But again... There's a message in there. There are some people who want other people punished. They don't want them to be saved. I hope God gets them back for what they did. You know? Well, maybe they're going to change. I hope they don't. Because <laughs> they deserve to be punished. This is not just a story of thousands of years ago. This is a story that's still happening today. The message, the story may have happened uh, in cartoon form that long ago. But the message is exactly the same for us today. This was very displeasing to Jonah that the people repented. Displeasing. What? He became angry. He prayed to the Lord, Oh Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning. Oh, baloney, he did. He <laughs> fled to Tarshish because he didn't want to do what the Lord told him to do. Now he's pretending like I knew you'd forgive him, so I didn't want you to forgive him, so I took off. Give me a break. 
very, uh, not exactly a truthful fellow, eh? And he thinks God's gonna, gonna kind of fall for that, eh? God's, eh, I don't know. It doesn't sound right to me, Jonah. <laughs> <laughs> That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, ready to relent from punishing. So there's another message intertwined into it. What is God like? Even though the Jews didn't seem to understand it, every once in a while you get little hints of it in the Old Testament too. That God is not the kind of God you think he is. He's a gracious God. He is merciful. He is slow to anger. He is abounding in steadfast love, and he is ready to relent from punishing. That's what Jesus told us. But for some reason, they always kept pushing for the the God who couldn't wait to get them back for what they did. I don't know why. That seemed to be in the mentality of the people. And it's still in the mentality of some people today, by the way. This is where the story gets kind of humorous, eh? The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come over Jonah. So there's the bush. (laughs) There's the bush. It came over Jonah to give... Yeah, (laughs) I just got it from the internet, so I don't know what kind of bush it is. (laughs) That's not why he was happy, by the way. (laughs) It was to give shade over his head because it was a hot day. So the Lord said, poof, there's a bush. This will help you stay cool, okay? Uh, To save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. Oh, thank you, God. This is great. You're such a great God. I love you. But he doesn't, really, deep down. He's just looking at himself. It's all about me. (laughs) That's the message. If I'm happy, then I believe in God. If bad things happen to me, I don't believe in God anymore. See, you see the message that's coming through? It's all intertwined. Um, Okay, so, but when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm. Appointed, that's a funny word, eh? God appointed, okay, you're in charge, Mr. Worm. You take care of that bush. (laughs) God appointed a worm that attacked the bush. And God wanted him to attack the bush. So that it withered. There's the withered bush over here. <laughs> it's funny, I found these things both, both sides in the, on the internet. The good bush and the withered bush. And you can see how angry he is now. He's even angry here, I don't know why. <laughs> uh, when the sun rose, it beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. Oh, this is terrible. You know, all the complaining in the world. Ah. <laughs> God's terrible, he's doing all these bad things to me, blah, 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 blah. Okay. But God said to Jonah, and here's the the big message at the very end of the story. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, yes, angry enough to die. It's all about me. Then the Lord said, you are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. It came into being in a night, and it perished in a night. (laughs) A bush. And should I not have been concerned about Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 people who do not know their right hand from their left, and also many animals? In other words, he's saying, you know, Jonah, you're more concerned about a stupid bush that you didn't even grow. I created the people of Nineveh. And now they've all turned against me. Should I not have tried to get you to bring them back to me? Isn't that what the whole message is about? (laughs) And then Jonah finally gets the message. You know, yes, Lord, I guess that's it. Yes, it is it, Jonah. But you see, if we hadn't seen uh, the the cartoon, the thing in cartoon form, it would have been just a long, drawn-out message, like a big sermon telling you one thing after another after another. It's much better if sermons contain stories because people can relate to stories. And so can the people of the Bible relate to stories. Now, remember that in those days, things were not written down and handed out. The book of Jonah was not handed out. Here, read this. You'll love it. <laughs> <You know? 
<clears throat> it was a group like this, and the, uh, the author would have stood up uh, and just said, I'm going to tell you a little story. That's why Jesus often told parables. They were the same. They always told stories. Eh? He always told. No one ever asked Jesus, did that actually happen? No. Because that wasn't the point. The point was, there's a message to this story. Every parable has a message. Every story in the Old Testament has a message. It's not about the story. It's about the message. Okay? Okay. <laughs> That's the message. All right. <laughs> Let's take a stretch so we can get some coffee, and then we'll come back. First time, we actually finished a little earlier. So let's grab a coffee and whatever else there is there. And okay, I think we're ready to begin again. <coughs> I don't want to... I won't talk as loudly this time. I'll put this a little higher. There. Okay. I often wonder how they got that picture, you know? <laughs> do cats do that? I don't know. All right. So I think we're ready. <laughs> okay. Otherwise, we'll be here all night. <laughs> you don't want to do that. <laughs> all right. And now, of course, we've been talking about the messages all the way through, and, uh, but now we're going to look at them specifically. And as we know, all the messages, the, the whole reason why we read the Bible at Mass or we read the Bible on our own in our prayer life or whatever is not just to remember nice stories. Just like those paintings, they're not just to look at nice paintings. They're to learn from what God is trying to teach us about their, their messages from the Lord. They're divine messages. That's why we call the Bible the Word of God. It is the Word of God. The message that God tries to give us, and sometimes we get it and sometimes we don't. And sometimes we reject it, which is even worse. Okay? But he never forces us to do it. Okay? Number one, message number one. There are about four that I, that I um, isolated anyway. Number one, this is an obvious one. God calls individuals in human history to help him. He has done this from the very beginning. Here's the call of Samuel here. Remember, he heard the voice of the Lord, and he thought Elijah was calling him. He says, no, I'm not calling you. God is calling you. You better listen to him. And even the Virgin Mary at the Annunciation, basically that's God calling a human being to help him with his mission with his ministry, okay? And so it's not just something in the Old Testament. The message that is found in the book of Jonah transcends the Old Testament and goes into the New Testament as well and into our own day today. So the Annunciation and the call of Samuel and many other calls of the prophets, we're going to see some of them here. Here's a, a, a call to Jeremiah, the prophet, the great Jeremiah, right? It's too bad they wrote that song, Hey, Jeremiah Was a Bullfrog. <laughs> Every time I say Jeremiah, everybody thinks of a, was he a frog? No, he wasn't a frog. Where were the, why would they call a frog Jeremiah? I don't know. Anyway. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. So God knows before the person is even conceived that he wants this person to do his will. He wants him to carry out a mission, a ministry, if you will. And Jeremiah, in his book of Jeremiah, tells us that, that God spoke to him and inspired him to come forth. Now, it's not as easy as that. Usually, you'd think when they were called, they would follow. No, Jonah didn't. And neither did Mary at the beginning. Remember she said, no, I'm not, you don't want me. St. Peter later on, no, I'm a sinful man. Get away from me, Lord. Remember? It's the same message that runs through the whole Bible. The whole Bible is in the book of Jonah. That's why the book of Jonah is one of my favorite books, even though it's a cartoon. It's a very important book. It's not a, a, a frivolous book. 
It's an important book in God's Word. Okay? Number two, the number two message is God's call always evokes the same human reactions throughout the Bible. All the time. They're the same reaction when God calls, and they're the same reactions for us too, you know. What are those reactions? Number one, a profound sense of spiritual unworthiness. When we are in the presence of God, we just feel so small. Eh? We feel so unworthy. We think he's making a big mistake. He doesn't really know what we're really like. Actually, he does. <laughs> and he picks us anyway. You know, that's something that we have to get through to people. You say, oh, well, no, if you only knew what I was really... No, I like you the way you are. We even say that to other people. If someone is your friend, you may not know a whole bunch about his life or her life, but you say, well, I don't care if you did that. I just care for you because I think you're a good person. And people always say, really? Are you telling me the truth? They never believe you, eh? And the prophets never believed God either when he told them they're okay. <laughs> so a profound sense of spiritual unworthiness. Where are the examples of this? Well, here's one example. The one we just talked about, St. Peter himself, when he caught all those fish. And uh, as soon as he saw that, he said, Depart from me, O Lord, for I am a sinful man. The first reaction. He doesn't say, Boy, it's great you're here. Or <laughs> uh, can you stick around for a while? No. It's, oh, this, there's somebody special here. I'm not worthy spiritually to see this or even to experience it. And yet he was worthy because God made him worthy. God wanted him just the way he was. Even though he made big mistakes later on, even after he was called, God did not reject him even after that. Even after he denied the Lord three times, he didn't say, okay, that's it, it's over. I thought you were a better guy than that. No. He knew, God knew that he would deny him eventually. He even, he even prophesied, you will deny me three times. You know? And so the first reaction of being spiritually unfit, if you will, not holy enough, if you will. You know? I remember asking a young man, <laughs> who I thought had a vocation to the priesthood. I really did. He was very, very devoted, very good. He would come to Mass all the time and so on. And he seemed very sincere, and I believe he was. And I suggested that one time. I said, have you ever thought about being a priest, maybe, or a deacon, maybe? Have you ever thought of that? The first thing he said was, I'm not holy enough, Father. I'm not holy enough. The same reaction spiritually unfit to be called to leadership position in the church of the Lord. That's what he's saying. And I said, well, you know, nobody's holy enough, but he didn't believe me. <laughs> he said, you are. I said, no, I'm not. <laughs> I wasn't picked because I was holy. I was picked because I was, I don't know why I was picked, but I was picked for some reason, not because I was the holiest guy in the classroom. Talk to my teachers in grade school and you'll find out. <laughs> But we never talk about grade school anymore, do we? <laughs> number, two, the react, number two reaction, a convinced feeling of not possessing the gifts to accomplish the work. Remember Jonah says, no, I can't do that. I better go the other way. And the prophets are even more verbal when it comes to that. They, they actually say it to God. And here, here's a few examples. When he appears to Moses and tells him about leading his people out of uh, Egypt. Oh, my Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor even now, that you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. In other words, I can't do what you're asking me to do. And Jonah, even though he didn't specifically say it, by running away from God, he was basically admitting that by his actions. I could never talk to the Ninevites. They wouldn't listen to me. I don't even know what I'm talking about. Okay? Everybody's always afraid they don't possess the gifts. I'll let you in on a little secret. <clears throat> as a priest, one of my favorite ministries as a priest is to preach the word of God. I love it. When I was in the seminary, that was my biggest fear, that I would have to eventually preach the word of God every Sunday. That was my biggest fear. I didn't think I could do it. And the priest professor said, you can do it, Pat, you can do it. 
No, you don't really know. I really can't. I'm afraid of doing it. I'm nervous when I do Everybody's nervous, they said. We're nervous too. But you will do it. You'll do fine. You know, I didn't believe them. And now, when I look back, I think, I love it. I'm doing it. And I enjoy it. I look forward to preaching every morning, not only Sundays, but every morning. In the old days, I thought, maybe I could skip a few Sundays and not preach. <laughs> you know, that's what I was thinking. And there are other seminarians who have said that to me as well, where they say, well, I didn't have time to prepare my homily. Can I be excused this time? No, you can't. <laughs> Thank goodness I'm not teaching at the seminary. That would be awful. <laughs> no, you stick with the program, buddy. Don't find any excuses. You can do it. You know you can do it. And if you can't, God will let you do it. He'll, he'll enable you to do it with his grace. That's what grace is all about. We say we believe in grace, but deep down sometimes we don't. Again, Moses, on the... You know what? I think I'm going to stand on this side so I can probably see better. On the day when the Lord spoke to Moses in the land of Egypt, he said to him, I am the Lord. Tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, all that I am speaking to you. Again. But Moses said in the Lord's presence, Since I am a poor speaker, why would Pharaoh listen to me? I can't do it. <laughs> Get somebody else. You know? That's Moses speaking, the great leader of Israel, who eventually became a great leader, but he didn't want to be. Jeremiah again, the great prophet. Then I said, ah, oh, Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am only a boy, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them. For I am with you. And so, uh, I know I can do this. <laughs> if I keep telling myself, I will. <clears throat> so, do not be afraid of them, for I am with you. I will be right there beside you to help you talk to them. And you can imagine Jeremiah saying, I don't know, you may say that, but I don't know if I believe you, you know? We tend to doubt the Lord when he speaks to us. We doubt him. We think he just doesn't quite get it. You know? But he does get it more than we get it. He's probably thinking the same thing of us. This guy just doesn't get it. You know? <laughs> I'm sure that's what he's thinking. Number three reason why we say that we don't want to do it. The assumed fears of rejection and failure. So you do it and then everybody says, we're not going to listen to you. We don't care what you say. That's what Jonah was afraid was going to happen in Nineveh. They won't listen to me. They're going to throw me out. The king will be so upset, he'll probably kill me. You know? Same thing with Moses. The Pharaoh, the Pharaoh of Egypt is going to listen to me? A Hebrew who never even went to school? You think he's going to listen to me? The Lord said, yes, he will. I'll make sure that I am with you. And I did go to school, <laughs> you know, so to speak. I made the school. Okay. <laughs> Yahweh said to Moses, Come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But again, Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? You see how many excuses we make? Thinking maybe God will get it eventually. Jonah had to be told a second time to go to Nineveh. The first time he tried to escape from God... And all the great prophets and the leaders of the people have done the same thing. And we do the same thing too. Okay? Even in my own vocation as a priest, I often remember thinking, I can't do that. Maybe, I, maybe this is the wrong calling for me. This was before I was ordained. Once you're ordained, you seem to understand that maybe things are better than you thought they would be, you know. <laughs> but until you get there, you're always doubting. Am I going to be able to do this? Will people listen to me? Thinking that I can't take the stress. Okay? Please find someone else. Sometimes that's what we say to God. That's what Jonah said to God by escaping. Just find somebody else. And he thought, if I go far enough away from Nineveh, maybe he'll change his mind. Because <laughs> to, to bring this guy all the way back, <laughs> you know, 
just let them go. I'll get somebody else closer to Nineveh, you know? No, he sent the fish, go get them, bring them back. <laughs> you didn't think about the fish, did you? <laughs> Notice what, they, what Moses again says, Then the Lord said to him, Who gives speech to mortals? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you are to speak. But he said, Oh, my Lord, please send someone else. <laughs> just does not get it. He just doesn't want, he wants to give up. But God was relentless. And Moses, we know in the end, when we look back, was the great, one of the greatest leaders of, of Israel. Right? Jeremiah, again, the great prophet. Now, this is a very interesting passage. I love this passage. Because this is a struggle between, between being called and doing what you're doing and sometimes being rejected, sometimes you are rejected, and then saying, uh, but I have to say it because my heart is telling me I have to say these things. Even though people don't like me, I've got to be honest with myself or I'll never be happy. Notice what he says, Oh Lord, you have enticed me and I was enticed. You have overpowered me and you have prevailed. I have become a laughing stock all the day long. Everyone mocks me. If I say I will not mention him or speak anymore in his name, then within me there is something like a burning fire shut up in my bones. I am weary with holding it in and I cannot. In other words, I'm torn between doing the will of God and being liked by people. What should I do? This is such a wonderful message about prophecy that we are called to be prophetic, to stand up for the truth in good times and not so good times. And sometimes it's not easy standing up for the truth because most people don't like to hear the truth. What did I do with the... Oh, it's over here. <laughs> Senior moment. Okay. I think I'll just hold it. <clears throat> well, they'll probably think on the TV that I'm drinking or something. <laughs> It's not drink, just water. <laughs> like Dean Martin. You remember Dean Martin? He'd always... <laughs> I'm dating myself with Dean Martin. But anyway, all my close friends are watching for me to stumble. These are my close friends. If they're watching me for to stumble, imagine the people don't like me. But the Lord is with me like a dread warrior. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble and they will not prevail. Jeremiah, in the end, said, yes, I'm going to do it. He was a brave guy. In the end, he didn't, he didn't argue with God the way Moses did. He eventually said, yes, I believe you, Lord. You will be with me, and I'm going to give him my best shot. That's what he said. And we know he gave it a great shot. You know? The assurance of God's grace and support to help, it's always there in the call. God says, I will help you. And we saw it in those other two passages. And here's another one. He always said to Moses, I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. In other words, it's a known fact that you will do it. I predict it. And I am God. I can't be wrong. That's what he's saying. When you have led them out of Egypt, and maybe at that point even Moses is saying, I don't know if that's going to happen. Yes, it will. It will happen, because I am with you. Eventually, Moses did get it, you know, but it took a long time. Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. In some translation, you'll be catching people, politically more correct, I think. When Jesus finally says to St. Peter, don't worry, I am with you. The exact same thing. Don't worry, I am with you. And, and Jesus is God, the second person of the Trinity. So when he says, I am with you, Peter understands. This is what happened in the Old Testament. He is calling me, and he is promising to be with me no matter what happens, even though I may not want to do it. Okay? So Peter goes along with it. Okay? Number three. The ultimate goal of God's call is to redeem and save his people who repent. That is the ultimate goal. It's the goal of the Annunciation. It's the goal of God calling Moses. It's to save his people, to save his people from damnation 
Not to punish them, but to save them. Just like the prodigal son story that Jesus tells us later on. The father wants the son to come back. And he pines for the son until he does come back. You know? Once we lose sight of this ultimate goal, we lose our own outward focus and we become centered on ourselves. We're here to save people, not to condemn them to hell. We have to remember that as Christians. Jonah wanted to condemn them to hell. Remember? The bush. You cried over this stupid bush? Should I not be crying over my people in Nineveh? The message of God in that wonderful story of Jonah, the same message comes through. Now I'm going to give you a little canon law here. <laughs> canon law helps us understand that. Canon law is what I studied. And this is the very last law in the book of laws that the church has, which is, as you can see, 1,752 laws we have. Forget the Ten Commandments and the Beatitudes. That's over and above that. <laughs> These are about how to sell church property, how to ordain people to the priesthood. How to... Every single thing you could think of is in this book called the Code of Canon Law. But notice what the last canon or the last law says always observing canonical equity and keeping in mind the salvation of souls, the salvation of souls, which in the church must always be the supreme law, the supreme law. In other words, the biggest law is they could break a million laws. Don't stick to the law. Stick to saving the person's soul. If you can do something to save that person's soul, don't keep quoting all the laws to him. By the way, canon such and such says this, you're going to be in big trouble. The reason these canons are there is to help us organize the church. But they're not there to condemn people to hell. They're there to save people. And once we lose sight of that, once we start quoting laws and regulations, unless you follow this law, you're damned to hell, then we're missing the point of the last canon in the Code of Canon Law. We should, we should write that on a piece of paper and put it on our fridge. <laughs> we really should. Every canon lawyer should do. Every priest should do this too, by the way. Anyone who knows the law should, know, should remember the last canon, which sometimes they miss. Eh? And number four, and this is the last one. God answers our prayers when we are distressed, not always in our way, but in his. He answered the prayer of Jonah. But Jonah never thought he'd be swallowed by a fish. He thought he'd just be saved by God and say, okay, forget about it. I'll get somebody else. He was praying, please, please. No, he ended up in Nineveh again where he didn't want to be. <laughs> See the story? It's wonderful. Because the story is the message. It gives us a message. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time saying, get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, to proclaim it. And so even though he prayed for safety, God answered his prayer, but not the way Jonah wanted it answered. <laughs> He didn't. He still got back to Nineveh, didn't he? <laughs> and that's a big part of the story. The message of the book of Jonah for us now. I'm going to move over here again. The message of the book of Jonah for us. Now we saw how it, how it worked in the Old Testament and the New Testament. But what about now? What about us? And there's just a couple of examples I have here for us. Things that I'm sure you'll be able to relate to. Okay. In other words... What is the portrait of this story, the book of Jonah? What is it? Number one, God continues to choose and to call individuals today to do his work. Now, we're not just talking about clergy and religious. We're talking about every baptized Christian. He calls us by name at our baptism to do his work. He does. And at confirmation, he calls us again and gives us his spirit. And at ordination for priests or marriage for those who are married. It doesn't, marry, it doesn't matter what call is there. It's not just the priests who follow the call of God. It's everybody. He continues to call us to do his work. Not our work, his work. Number two, he promises us uh, his help if we accept. He doesn't force us to accept, but he promises to help us if we do. He'll put little things in our life that will entice us, like Jeremiah. You've enticed me, Lord. You've enticed me. 
How did that happen in my life? Well, whenever I thought maybe I, I started to doubt my vocation to the priesthood, I would meet a priest who was very inspiring. And I thought, boy, this guy's great. I'd like to be like him, you know? Who do you think sent that in my way? I think God sent that my way. Because that's how he had the fish swallow me up and cast me back up. Just when I was doubting, eh? Same story. Okay. If throughout our calling we lose our focus on the Lord, as I mentioned in the Old Testament there, and on his ultimate goal, we will be overwhelmed and will ultimately fail. Now, I, this isn't a very good picture, <clears throat> but it's only, the only one I could find that kind of showed this priest hearing confessions and getting a little bit frustrated or, or burnt out, if you will. We can really get burnt out if it's all about us and it's not about the mission of the Lord. We really can. We can tell ourselves, why is God not sending more people to church? Why is God not helping people not to sin? Why is God... We could really burn ourselves out as clergy, especially, and any Christian. Many Christians today are saying, why is there such a problem in the church all the time? Why are these things happening? What? In other words, we get burnt out ourselves. But it's not about us. It's about God's mission that he wants us to do. <laughs> and finally, this last one, I think it's the last one. You'll recognize this man. If you don't recognize him here, you'll recognize him there. That's Pope John Paul I. The last part of the message of Jonah, remember he said, when I prayed to you, Lord, you answered me. But God answered him not the way he wanted. Finally, God always answers the prayers of the distressed though not always in their way, but in his. This is Cardinal Luciani before he became Pope, Albino Luciani. He was the patriarch of Venice. He did not want to become Pope. He didn't. He just did not. <laughs> he prayed and prayed and prayed that God would deliver him from being elected Pope. He just didn't want it. He liked doing what he was doing in Venice. He was the bishop there. He liked his people there. He didn't want to have all these problems in the Vatican, and there were lots. But he was elected, and when he realized that this was the will of God in his life, he accepted the will of God, even though at his election, he has to be asked, the Pope is asked, do you accept election? Do you accept election? He could have said no. But he realized in his own mind, because he knew all about this other stuff. He knows the Bible. He knows the book of Jonah. He know Remember, all these things people know about if they have a vocation. He knew I could be like Jonah running to Tarshish when he wants me to go to Nineveh. <laughs> I better follow the will of the Lord. And he did. And we know that he died after 33 days in office. Now, I know there's all this conspiracy theory and all the rest of it. I don't believe that. If you read his life, you realize that he had real problems when he was growing up. He was even, uh, he almost died at birth. He wasn't breathing properly when he was born. Uh, and then later on, he had many uh, pulmonary problems, you know, thrombosis and all these things. They never seem to tell us those things about his life, unless you read a biography of him, a true biography, you know. And that was one of the reasons why he thought he couldn't do it. Lord, I'm not healthy. I cannot do this job. And he and the doctor had always told him, you try to avoid stress as much as you can. Well, as the Pope, how am I going to avoid stress? <laughs> it's hard enough in Venice. If I have to take care of the whole world, how is it? But God still wanted him for some reason. For some reason, he still wanted him. For those 33 days, they call him today, Il Papa del Sorriso in Italian. The Pope of the smile, the smiling Pope, <laughs> because he always used to smile. Now, he's not smiling much here. <laughs> he's not smiling much there. But most of the time, he did smile. And they were used to Pope John XXIII, who was very smiley all the time. Then they got Paul VI, who was a little more dour. Nice guy, but mm, really serious all the time. And then they got John Paul I. Poof, we're back to John XXIII again. <laughs> this is great. And then he passed away, and then we got John Paul II, and all the things that he did, you know. <laughs>
We always think it's a big tragedy when these things happen. And then you say, maybe this was part of God's plan. I don't know. Someday we'll find out. And so God does answer prayer. That's what the book of Jonah tells us. But not necessarily the way we want it to answer it, but the way he wants to do it. <laughs> and so, as Jesus said in the agony in the garden, thy will be done, not my will, but thine. Even God's son had to say that to his father. Not my will, but yours be done. Okay? Let's end with a final prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Lord God, we praise and thank you for creating us in your image, each in a unique way, for making us your people, for inspiring and guiding us with your Holy Spirit, and for sending us your Son, who came to save us and to teach us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. St. Peter, pray for us. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, have a nice night. <laughs> See you next week. Join us next week.